power through weakness. Is that possible? Hey, welcome. It's another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, who called us to live to a higher standard, not satisfied with just a little shallow religion in life as a substitute for giving God our best. As our series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others, all influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Today we begin a five-part look at power through weakness. Our first program, A Life Hidden in Christ. And later, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Sounds like an old hymn, doesn't it? We'll also be hearing from Elizabeth's younger brother, Jim Howard. And uh, he tells us what people might be surprised to know about Elizabeth. And as we think about power through weakness... In what way did Elizabeth show strength? Elizabeth's daughter, Valerie, also joins us today as she talks about adjusting to life in the U.S. Change can be a difficult thing. It can remind us of our own weakness. Was it difficult for her? I hear about that later. Right now, though, a life hidden in Christ. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says and underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend Elizabeth Elliot talking with you today about power through weakness. You feeling weak today? Do you know that lovely hymn which comes from this passage in Jeremiah 31.3? We are loved, the Bible tells us, with an everlasting love. Let me read it to you directly from the Bible. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. And there's a hymn, Loved with everlasting love, led by grace that love to know. Spirit, breathing from above, thou hast taught me it is so. O oh, this full and perfect peace, O oh, this transport all divine, in a love which cannot cease, I am his, and he is mine. The Holy Spirit teaches us that we are loved. He explains that it is everlasting, unchangeable, unlimited. And therefore, God says, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Now the truth is, which I'm sure we're all aware of, we are not, by nature, lovable. We need help. We need all the help we can get. I do, anyway, don't you? I'm unworthy, of course. I'm selfish. That's the way I was born. I'm unloving. Love doesn't come naturally, not the kind of love that the Bible describes. Have you ever tried loving somebody who's unworthy, or selfish, or unloving? Well, I'm sure that every single person that's listening to me can think of someone with those characteristics that perhaps you've even given up on by now, or you've been struggling and trying to learn to love that person. We can't do it by ourselves, can we? We need all the help we can get. And of course, we're always tempted to say, yes, but he, why doesn't he do this or that? As long as she does so and so and so and so, how am I supposed to love her? And But after what she did to me, etc. Well, let's go to Deuteronomy 33, 26 to 29, and I think you'll recognize some of the words from this passage. There is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides on the heavens to help you and on the clouds in his majesty. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. That's verse 27 from Deuteronomy 33. He will drive out your enemy before you, saying, Destroy him. So Israel will live in safety alone. Jacob's spring is secure in a land of grain and new wine, where the heavens drop dew. Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. He is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. Your enemies will cower before you, 
and you will trample down their high places. Sometimes you've heard me say on Gateway to Joy, every experience, if offered to Jesus, can be your gateway to joy. Does that sound to you like a wildly optimistic view? Well, you're right about that. It is wildly optimistic, but not really wildly, because the grace of God is just that. It is beyond our wildest imaginings that the Prince of Glory, the Infinite Majesty, the Creator of the Stars, should love us so much and humble himself so drastically and stoop to our human weakness as to offer his power and his love and his salvation. I mean, that is really almost unbelievable, isn't it, when we think about it? And yet we are asked to believe that because that is the message of Scripture from beginning to end. He loves us with an everlasting love. And nothing that we ever can do will change the fact that he loves us. Now, to whom am I speaking today who feels his own weakness? Perhaps you feel far from God, yet you're aware of needing help. Here's a letter from a listener. Approximately 18 months ago, I spent six weeks in a state mental hospital for depression. I had been saved for years. I completely committed while in the hospital, and I became a new man. A part of releasing the terminal fear was to acknowledge that God had control over life or death of my wife and five children. I gave complete trust to him and knew that his plan for me and everyone is for the best. The next year was the greatest in my marriage and in all my relationships. I have weaned off all medication and have done well for nearly one year. In February, my wife died, 44 years old, from asthma. My complete trust in my Lord that he has the best for me has sustained me. His joy has comforted me through this time. My children and I have learned valuable lessons and acquired another notch in our character that we could not have learned any other way. From my worldly past, I have never entered into marriage sexually pure. I have prayed and been blessed with the chance to marry a godly woman. I wish to enter marriage the right way this time. I feel the breath of Jesus on my face, and I couldn't bear to see him frown upon me. Passion is a very strong part of the flesh. I look forward to reading your book. I think perhaps he was talking about my book called Passion and Purity. Well, there's an amazing testimony, isn't it? A man who had to go into a mental hospital because of such deep depression, but through the simple acknowledgement by faith that God was in control, even over life and death, the life and death of his wife and his five children, that gave, he says, complete trust. And I knew that his plan for me and for everyone was the best. We're talking about power through weakness. Humans, all of us, are born with a fallen nature. It's the fruit of sin. We are self-centered and righteous and determined and preoccupied and lovers of ourselves. And it says in 2 Timothy 3 that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. Are we really that bad? Well, try 1 Corinthians 13 for a simple test. We don't have time to go through that today, but 1 Corinthians 13 is the formula for the kind of love that a Christian is meant to offer to anyone, no matter whether that person hates you or loves you. There are two kingdoms, the kingdom of self and the kingdom of Christ. Which one will I crown? To whom do I belong? The phone rang as I was preparing this, and a dear friend told about a letter from a wife in Maine who was expecting number nine. She was on welfare, 
Her husband reads theology, calls himself a Christian, has no work, is very hateful, and the wife feels that she is in a position of utter helplessness. What can we say to someone who writes to us about these things? What can we possibly say except what the Bible says? We don't know the answers to your questions. We don't know all the ins and outs of your situation. But we know the one who knows, the Lord himself. And it is to him that we always want to point you. In Isaiah 61, 3, it says that we are to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Now, of course, we can't bestow those things. It's the Lord who does it. But the Lord has sent us, hasn't he, to bind up the brokenhearted as he sent Jesus. Jesus says, follow me. And so we are to do in this world what Jesus did. But it's impossible except in the strength of the Lord. Jesus said, all power is given unto me. And yet he stands at the door and knocks. If we open, then we are inviting him not merely as a transient guest, but as Lord, Master, Ruler of the Kingdom. His kingdom now, not mine. My life is hidden in Christ, surrendered to Christ. Is yours? It's not difficult, you know. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Here was a man, weak to the point of desperation, needing professional help, going into a hospital, but then finding the answer, so simple, of utter surrender, utter acknowledgement that God was in control. Part one in our five-part series, Power Through Weakness, A Life Hidden in Christ. Well, we'll be hearing from Valerie Elliott Shepherd, Elizabeth's daughter, a little bit later. We'll also be hearing part two of this series, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. But first, let's hear from Jim Howard, Elizabeth's younger brother. He talks about what people might be surprised to know about his older sister, You know, as we think about power through weakness, how did Elizabeth show strength and even more? Yes, I think there are some things that would help people understand that she was very human, like all of us. And although she did seem to exude an aura of authority and self-confidence in some ways, both in her public speaking and writing, uh, and, and an aura of strength, uh, because, of course, she was called upon to endure a number of hardships. But the other side of that is that she had a soft, tender heart, a love for the Savior. And I knew that as I grew up with my big sister. Jim Howard, younger brother of Elizabeth. Later on, we'll hear from Valerie Elliott Shepard, Elizabeth's daughter, as she talks about adjusting to life in the U.S. But first, we continue our series, Power Through Weakness. My hope is built on nothing less. Heaven above is softer blue. Earth around is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue. Christless eyes have never seen. Birds with gladder songs o'erflow. Flowers with deeper beauty shine. Since I know, as now I know, I am his, and he is mine. When we enter into the kingdom of Christ, we enter a place of beauty, joy, peace, quietness, such as we've never known before. The third stanza of that same hymn, Things that once were wild alarms cannot now disturb my rest. Closed in everlasting arms, pillowed on the loving breast. Oh, to lie forever here, 
doubt and care, and self resign. While he whispers in my ear, I am his, and he is mine. Things that once were wild alarms. When we resign ourselves, entrust ourselves completely and unreservedly into God's hands, what a difference it makes. Self-resignation. Old words, aren't they? Archaic. We hardly ever use them now. They're very seldom understood nowadays, but they are essential if we are to advance in spiritual life. The recognition that God is in charge of everything. Indifference to worldly concerns or opinions. Not easy for us, is it? We fill our brains with fashions and videos and sports and cars and diversions and food and others' judgments and opinions, and we get so bogged down and so nervous and so stressed out, as everybody says. But the Lord wants us to recognize our weakness and our vulnerability in order that we may lay hold upon his strength. Now I have a wonderful illustration of power through weakness that happens to be very close to my heart because it has to do with the events that took place in my oldest grandson's life just this past winter. His name is Walter, and he went to Peru to spend six months with his great-uncle, Bert Elliott. Bert Elliott is Jim Elliott's older brother, has been in Peru for 45 years as a missionary, and he continues there. And Walter went down to spend six months under his tutelage, helping with construction, learning Spanish, and teaching English as a second language. And at the end, toward the end of his visit, he decided to go down to Bolivia, where he has a cousin named Steve Hawthorne, who is a doctor, a missionary doctor. On his way back from Bolivia, he was robbed twice. Talk about a discipline. Most of us would deplore ever being robbed, and I suppose many of you have been robbed in one way or another. We've had our house robbed twice, and I've lost, I had my wallet stolen from me one time. But these two robberies took place on two successive days. In both cases, it was two men who jumped him, slammed him up against a wall, and in the second case, actually put a knife to his throat. And the experience was a terrible one. But his response to that experience we found most heartening. He sent a fax to his father, starting out with, this is a hard fax to do as it lets you in on the lousiness of the state of my material goods. Flat out been robbed, blind, done got accosted by two pairs of wretches, two times. Now he's just using his father's sort of Mississippi kind of language. His dad grew up in Louisiana and they had a pastorate in Mississippi too. So he's just using that kind of language sort of with tongue in cheek. Um, Incident number one went down the night of Friday last, a few items snatched, the notable one being my passport. The afternoon of the next day, the greater part of my personal effects was liberated from the rightful owner. Not a few irreplaceable stuffs gone. Man, solid, gone. It's best to ask what did I not lose. Notably, plane ticket out of town, where I was stiffed completely, my camera, shoes, and jacket on my back, my quid, that is his money, absolutely not one penny centavo of cash lost. So those were the things he was able to keep, and his Spanish Bible. These, you will agree with me, are good not to lose, and I am most grateful to our Father for what he allowed me to keep, perhaps most notably of all, life on this earth. This appears to have been in danger at one point. But this was his response to the whole thing. I have the same support and fortitude as lots of men abiding in much awfuler wildernesses. This was Job's support. He was not overcome with rage and despair when he received news that the Sabians had carried off his cattle, slain his servants, and that the remainder of both were consumed with fire, that the Chaldeans had robbed him of his camels, and that his seven sons were crushed to death by the falling of the house they were sitting in. He resolved 
all these misfortunes and horrors into the agency of God, his power and sovereignty, and even thanked him for doing what he would with his own. You remember that Job said, The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Walter goes on to say, If another should slander me in word, injure me in deed, I shall not be prone to anger, when, with David, I consider that the Lord hath bidden him. He's referring there to an Old Testament story where a man was cursing David, and one of David's friends wanted to deal with this man, and David said, Leave him alone. The Lord has told him to curse me. Lima is sure a dreary town when you've been in such stunning surroundings as mountains of Peru and Bolivia. Everything gray and flat here, dirty, rugged, this is all part of growing up and more vital and learning to pray without hesitation or reserve. That God's will may be done in us, on us, by us. That in all his dealing with us, he may consult his own glory alone. I am very, very humbled by all this, and I hope a good blow has been struck at my pride. Of course, it's only by our Lord's grace and mercy holding me up from falling into the most low-down, filthy, thievingest, throwaway, dirt-ragged, stealer ways of a worthless jerk who takes what ain't his by rotten means. Physically, I'm turning out fine as can be, and there doesn't seem to be no mental anguish nor other uncalled-for personal problems, although having no underwear is troublesome. Had a bruise on my leg, but it's starting to go away. Other bruises and soreness almost gone. I'm sleeping in a house owned by some very generous, kind, and reputable missionaries. Am eating well after several weeks of lean times. Have had some mean dreams at night, but so tired I forget and it goes away. Earthly possessions, no matter what, are foolish to lose any time, energy, or religion over. There is a purpose. This is real, and God has a very sure plan for it all. And each of my truly insignificant, this I forget quick, possessions, and they weren't mine truly, but given to me to use but a little while. Now it's all given to someone else. Now there's an interesting testimony from a young man who saw past the loss of many things, including, and I think perhaps this was the most difficult thing, the six months journal that he had kept throughout his time in South America. Irreplaceable, of course. Second Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong." paradoxes, aren't they? Scriptural paradoxes, and the Bible is full of them. The kind of power that I need is completed only in my acceptance of my helplessness. The kind of power I need is completed only in my acceptance of my helplessness. The discipline of self-despair. You know that old hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Not on my strength, I have none. Nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Part two of Power Through Weakness. My hope is built on nothing less. Well, before we go, let's hear from Valerie Elliott Shepherd, Jim and Elizabeth's daughter, as she talks about adjusting to life in the U.S. We've been thinking about weakness. Was that time of change difficult for her? I'm not sure. I was truly shocked um, because we had seen the mountains around Quito 
a lot from flying in and out of Shandia and Quito, I mean, Shalmetta. So seeing those mountains, when we moved to New Hampshire, there are gorgeous mountains in New Hampshire. So that was a homecoming almost for me. Um, of course, we weren't in a jungle, but we had woods around us and it was wonderful. I was allowed to roam free through the woods and went down to a river, it was not a deep river. I played and played just like I had in the jungle. I don't remember being terribly lonely though, um, because my mother found two girls that were going to be in my class that I got together with a couple of times before school started. I don't know how she found them, but the Lord um, led her to them. And I'm very grateful for those two friends because they welcomed me into their class as I had to come in a little bit late that first day as the bus drove right by me as it was to pick me up. And I was all ready to be picked up and it went on up the mountain. And what my mother had not heard him say was that he was going to pick me up on the way back down from the mountain. So that was my first sorrow, you know, like I thought I was going to school today and I'm already with my new lunchbox and my new clothes and all this. But anyway, these two girls saw me come into the room and the teacher said, we have a new girl. All the other students were already seated. And so I was very self-conscious and, uh, these two girls whispered to me, come here, Valerie, come sit by us. So they had a place for me. And I just remember the first week or two of school being a little bit scared, a little bit nervous because I'd never been in that setting before. But the Lord just, the Lord helped me to be adaptable. I have that kind of personality anyway. I like changes. So it was, it was uh, fun. But I was thankful, thankful for um, just being able to go to a small school and have some good friends. And uh, my fifth and sixth grade teacher was absolutely fantastic. And so I loved her dearly. And I remember the excitement of my mother saying, let's have her over for supper. And we had her for dinner one night and she loved her too. And so I don't remember any huge shocks. I really don't. Well, as our time comes to an end, let me thank you for letting us come into your home, your office wherever we found you today. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliot.org. Easy to remember, elizabethelliot.org for more talks, devotionals, videos, and other resources, including more Gateway to Joy programs. Hey, and if you get a chance, leave us a review. This comes from a 15-year-old ERCM. I have listened to 11 or 12 of Elizabeth Elliot's episodes on dating, marriage, and the like, and I love them. I love how she reminds us of the roles of men and women, and how instead of being angry at the differences, we should celebrate them and accept with gratitude the roles we have been given. She writes, she has encouraged me in many ways. She was not simply a rules lady, but a woman after God's own heart who, with kindness and humility and some humor, aspired to share both her story and explanations of biblical questions. Well, thank you for those kind words, and until next time, may God remind you daily, you are loved with an everlasting love, and underneath are those everlasting arms. <laughs>